in this talk, I'm going to give you 10 steps, 10 suggestions on how you can grow in your prayer life. However, I can, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm a theologian, okay? So I can teach you how to pray. Uh, I've been teaching for many, many years. So I can teach you how to pray. But I, can, I cannot give you the desire to pray. That I can't give you. Sorry. So I repeat, I can teach you how to pray. We have a New York expression, you can take the horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink the water. Okay? Or I can, uh, I can, place, I can, I can place a bat on your shoulder, but you've got you to swing it. Huh? Okay, I can place a bat on your shoulder, but for able to hit, you got to connect with the ball. So uh, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you all the instruments. I'll give you the ball, the the bat to hit the ball. I'll give you the fishing rod to catch the fish. But you have to. You will have to. You have to beg. You have to beg the Holy Spirit. Beg the Holy Spirit that you have a desire to pray. For example, even though I'm on this mission, if I spent. I already spent two hours in prayer this morning. Okay. Uh, so you know, with, without prayer, I'm uh, I'm not worth anything, no. But if I pray, God works miracles. God works miracles. So the whole thrust of this is is uh, hoping that you really have a desire to pray. When I was a teenager in New Jersey, I would walk to school a couple miles. And as a 15-year-old, I would pray three rosaries with my, on my hands when I was walking to school. I've never heard a teenager do that except me. I'm not tooting my own horn, but it's just a huge grace that, uh, for me, prayer was almost something that, that was natural. Honestly, a good, you know, a good parents, no? I didn't come from a dysfunctional family, but a very good family, right? Very good family. Where my parents uh, were really good, strong, practicing Catholics, and you know, you, you're influenced by your parents, obviously, right? Okay, so let's start, let's start, off, with, uh, let's start off with a definition of prayer. Then I'll give you the, the different um, tools that you should use to pray well. So definition of prayer, and then uh, what are the tools that we should use to pray well? I'm sure some of you have heard of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. (laughs) Have you read it? Okay, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Maybe we've got a few catechists here. Okay, the Catechism is divided into four parts. The dogmatic part, the moral part, the sacramental part, and then the part on prayer. The dogma would be the creed. Moral theology would be the Ten Commandments that we're going to be going through a good part of the retreat. Sacramental would be the the channels of grace. They're called the sacraments. And then prayer. Um, I've read quite a bit, but I humbly believe that the Fourth part of the Catechism on Prayer is one of the greatest spiritual masterpieces in the history of the world. So if you want to learn how to pray, it's the shortest part, and it's the easiest one to understand. Because some of the part, you get through the dogmatic part, uh, not that easy, hyperstatic union and certain theological expressions to express the Trinity, it's, it's kind of heady theological lingo, no? But the part on prayer is pretty simple. So in the part on prayer, there are, there are definitions. The, the first definition given is by St. John Damascene. St. John Damascene was a, an Eastern doctor of the church. You have what are called the Latin doctors of the church, 
And then you have the Eastern doctors of the church. The Latin doctors of the church would be Augustine and Ambrose and Gregory the Great and Jerome. Those are called the Latin ones. Then the Eastern one would be Basil the Great and Gregory Nazianzen and Gregory Nazeno, St. Athanasius, but also St. John Damascene. And he's quoted as such. Prayer is the lifting up of the mind and heart to God. Can you say that? Prayer is the lifting up of the mind and heart to God. How about with your hands? Prayer is the lifting up of the mind and heart to God. Great definition. The other day I was giving a, a class on St. Faustina Kowalska. I expl- I'm explaining the diary of St. Faustina for two years in my parish. And she said she was drawn, she went to the chapel, and right away she started to talk to God, but with her heart and not with words. Interesting. St. Faustina. But with her heart, not with words. Not to say that we can't pray vocal prayer. Vocal prayer is important. But uh, the heart of prayer is our heart. The heart of prayer is our heart. The essence of prayer is our heart. So we lift up your mind and your heart to God. There you have a good definition of prayer. Okay, another definition. Prayer, St. Teresa of Avila says that prayer is esto. La oración es nada más que amistad con Dios pasando tiempo largo con aquel que yo sé que me ama. Okay? Well, that would be the Spanish, okay? Prayer is basically spending a long time in silence with the one that I know loves me. That's the definition of St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa of Avila is the doctor of prayer. So in that, you get three ideas. Prayer is you're in silence. You have to have silence. Number two, you're spending a long time with the friend that I know loves me. That's beautiful, isn't it? Spending time with a friend. Jesus is the friend that I know loves me. So silence Length, you got to spend some time with the friend that loves you. That's Teresa of Avila. Okay, another definition. This is a simple catechetical definition you teach your children. Prayer is talking to God. It's a good definition. Prayer is talking to God. Okay, here's another definition that one of our oblate priests wrote in his catechism book. And I like this. Prayer is... Prayer is... Listening to God, talking to God, and loving God. Those three verbs. Prayer is listening to God. Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. Prayer is speaking to God. Speak, O O Lord, for your servant is listening. And prayer is loving God. Now, of all the sentiments in prayer... The most important is loving God. So loving God is the most important thing in prayer, and loving God is the most important thing in our lives. What St. John of the Cross says, in the twilight of our existence, we will be judged on love. That's St. John of the Cross. Okay, now I'd like to give you um, a little phrase that I've coined, and I'll 
talk a little bit about what Augustine says on prayer and St. Alphonsus. Okay, I've, I've written a little analogy on prayer. What, okay, what oxygen is to the lungs, prayer is to the soul. Got it? You like that? Good, right? What, what oxygen is to the lungs, prayer is to the soul. Um, uh, I've always been a good athlete, okay? Uh, I, I like sports. Uh, when I was 12, I swam my first mile. I could swim underwater about a minute, no? So pretty good lungs, no? Ran cross country. Uh, played uh, baseball at Villanova when I was younger, no? But I remember when I was swimming under the water for a minute, when I came up, and I surfaced. Oh, man, was that air sweet. Man. Oh, that air was sweet. So we should, have, we should have even more hunger and thirst for prayer than someone who wants to fill his lungs with, wa- with air after he's been underneath the water for a minute. No? That's the analogy I'm trying to give. Because if we don't breathe, we're going to die, right? It may be going a minute or two or three minutes without breathing, and then you're going to die. You're going to get blue in the face, right? Then you're going to die. So, what oxygen is to the lungs, so prayer is to the soul. He'd like to give you now what St. Saint, Saint Alphonsus says. This is also quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguri. Have you heard of him, St. Alphonsus, some of you? Think about this compliment. St. Alphonsus, uh, when he's already in his 60s, he's going to live to be about 90, but his health is already deteriorating when he's in 50s and 60s. Uh, The Pope calls and says, I want you to be a bishop. And there he is, busy founding the Redemptorist and giving popular missions. And um, he says to the Holy Father, well, I can't do that. I'm just not, I'm too busy and I'm just not up to it. You know what the Pope said? He said, Alphonsus, your shadow is enough to sanctify the whole diocese. Could you say your shadow is enough to sanctify your family? (laughs) Fat chance, huh? (laughs) Because he was so holy. He was so holy that even, you know, even when he was a bishop, everyone knew him to be, he knew he was a brilliant man. He had like uh, two doctors in law by the time he was 17. So he was a brilliant man, but holy man. And uh, this is what he said on prayer. He said, he, he who does not pray will be damned. He who prays will be saved. And he who prays little places his salvation in jeopardy. St. Alphonse de Liguri, doctor of the church. Who wrote possibly the greatest Marian book in the history of the, of the world. It's called The Glories of Mary, which is a commentary on the Salve Regina that we sang at the end of the Mass. Okay, I'll give you one more more, um, quote from a saint, then we'll go into some of the suggestions to improve in our prayer life. St. Augustine. St. Augustine, one of the greatest writers in the Catholic Church. I'll say this in English, but if, you, if it were said in Latin, it would be much more beautiful. He says, He who prays well, lives well. He who lives well, dies well. He who dies well, all is well. Amen? You like that? Yes. Can you imagine that in the Latin? Wow. He who prays well, lives well. He who lives well, dies well. He who dies well, 
all is well. Amen, huh? So what he's saying is the quality of our life, of our spiritual life, is in proportion to the depths of our prayer life. Okay. There we have some definitions and sayings of the saints on prayer. Now I would like to go through some suggestions on how we can improve our prayer life. But as a preliminary, as I said in the beginning of this talk, I can teach you how to pray. But I cannot give you, I cannot give you the desire to pray. I can't give that to you. You have to fall on your knees and beg the Blessed Mother, and you have to beg the Holy Spirit that you have a desire to pray. So I'm going to give you, I'll I'll give you the fishing rod, I'll give you the baseball bat, I'll give you the skillet, (laughs) Uh, but you got to beg for the grace. Okay, number one is this. And this is one of the reasons why I'm here these three days is purity of mind, heart, body, and soul, and intention. One of the major obstacles to growing in prayer is lack of purity. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Jesus says, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. If we do not have purity, then we're not going to be able to pray well. We can't. That's inimical to, inimical to prayer is impurity. So, two, pray well. It's very important that we purify the eyes of our soul, purify the eyes of our soul through a good sacramental confession. Yes, confession and prayer, they're linked. I'll give you an analogy. Okay, in your home, I'm sure you clean your windows. You got a dirty window. You got to go to the store. They have this in Houston, Windex, you know, the famous Windex. Get some Windex. Windex is a spray, and you spray it, huh? Then get a dry newspaper, not a, not a, Not a wet newspaper, but a dry newspaper, and you rub. After you apply the Windex and you apply the dry newspaper, that window pane is going to be clear. So when the you open up the curtains and the sun comes in, it's going to be beaming in, inundating your house. So the precious blood of Christ cleans your soul so that when Jesus, the Son of God, comes to you and you're praying to him, you're going to be able to contemplate contemplate him with greater purity. So blessed are the pure of heart, for they, they will see God. Next is this. You have, if you're going to pray, you have to give time to prayer. St. Teresa of Avila says, you learn how to pray by praying. Any, anything that you, wanna, you, want, you want to learn 
and to be competent at. You got to spend time that time at it. You want to learn the art of speaking a foreign language. Some of you are are immigrants, maybe from another country. It took me a it took me a while to speak Spanish. My no, my Spanish is perfect. I even have a I have a radio program in L.A. in Spanish. <laughs> But I had to work at it. Any teachers here, any, any you know, teaching languages, there are three things you have to learn. You have vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. Those are the three building blocks of linguistic skills. You have to have vocabulary. But you have to have grammar, but also you have to have pronunciation. And you can apply that to anything. St. Alphonse says the art of all arts is the art of prayer. The art of all art. So you have to give yourself time to pray. One of my favorites, one of my favorites is a man, his name is Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. Any of you ever hear of him? Have you? How many of you have you have met him personally? Okay, both of us, yeah. I met him, yeah. What a man of God. He died in 1979, December 9th, no? Right after the Immaculate Conception of the Feast of Juan Diego. No? You know, at the end of his life, he was the Bishop of uh, Rochester, New York. And then according to canon law, canon law, which is the law of the church, you have to send into a letter to the Pope to retire when you're 75. So he sent in his letter of retirement, and he's going to live about another nine years into his um, almost his mid-80s. Any of you know what he did the last nine years of his life? Okay, he, he, he wrote, he was a prolific writer, wrote about 70 books, no? Uh, you read his writing, you can tell this is a saint, very deep, but very spiritual. But what he did was he spent the last nine years of his life basically giving retreats to priests and bishops. To, to retreats to priests and bishops. You can get it online. And you know, he was pretty blunt with him. He said, look, when you preach and teach, people don't listen at times. But he said, when I preach and teach, people always listen to me. And he wasn't bragging, but it was true. Fulton Sheen was the first tele-evangelist in this country. He beat out Milton Berle, who was the most famous comedian in the world. He called him Uncle Milty. (laughs) So Milton Berle would be on the TV program, and Fulton Sheen had more people watching him, millions of Americans watching Fulton Sheen on public TV. This archbishop from New York. But he said the reason why, he said, the reason why people don't listen to you is because I have the hour of power. Amen? (laughs) Hour of power. You know what that means? He made a holy hour. So after this talk, I'm going to be giving you two handouts. One handout is on the tools for prayer, I'm going to give you an article that I wrote on the hour of power in one of my blogs. Now, I want you to read these. Don't turn them into airplanes or use them for your bird nest, okay? Read them, okay? Maybe some of you have read The Life of Fulton Sheen, The Treas- Treasures in Clay. Yeah, I recommend that you read it, no? Any of you know why he prayed the Holy Hour? Very fascinating. This is what happened. When he was a, uh, I think just about ordained, he heard the story of a Chinese girl in communist China. This little girl, about maybe 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old, was praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, making her holy hour. 
she didn't really have know exactly what the whole, but she spent long hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament, this little girl. So on one occasion, the commies came in, broke into the church, and with their rifles, they were shooting all throughout the church, these bullets, destroying some of the statues as well as the, the articles in the church. And then one of the soldiers took his machine gun and aimed at the Blessed Sacrament, and the bullets riveted into the tabernacle door, ripped it off. These are bullets. And then some of them riveted into the ciborium. You know what the ciborium is? Where the hosts are. And then the hosts were scattered on the floor. There are 34 of them. But none of the soldiers were aware that there was this little girl that was praying in the church. She was in somewhat of a hidden place. So they rushed out of the rushed out of the church, and there the girl saw that there were these hosts that were scattered on the ground. So she came back the following day, she made, made her holy hour, then she bent over and lapped up the host with her tongue, because back this is back probably in 1950, something like that, maybe even earlier. She lapped up the host with, because you couldn't touch the host with your hand. Only the priest could. So the following day, she did the same. She did it for a week, and then two weeks, and then three weeks, and then she did it for a month, and then 33 days, and one, there was one host left. So what happened was, the, fo- the, 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 last, the last host was there. She made her holy hour. And she lapped up the host. Then the soldiers that day barged into the church again. This time, one of the soldiers saw the little girl. And he took the rifle, the butt of the rifle, the back end, and bludgeoned the girl to death. So she was killed by, that, by the butt of the rifle. You can say that she was a, a martyr for the holy hour. She should be canonized, I really believe. And Fulton Sheen said to himself, Here I live in free America. This girl sacrificed her life. Shouldn't I be willing to make the sacrifice of making a holy hour every day for my own sanctification as a priest? and the for sanctification of others. So here's a challenge for you. One of the programs that I've written out of the uh, spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius, a 10-week program, where the people that are in my program are making a daily holy hour. They're in Los Angeles and... Orange County, I've got six groups now, and we've got about 1,200 people that are in my groups, no? In L.A., in LA there's huge numbers of people. Now, why didn't you make a proposal for this retreat? Why didn't you make a proposal? Starting tomorrow, you're going to make your daily holy hour. I didn't say happy hour, I said holy hour, okay? You hear me? As a result of this mission, I'm not here by chance. God sent me here. Take seriously, take seriously the suggestions I'm making to you because God speaks with the priest. God speaks to the priests. Give yourself a holy hour. You got a blessed sacrament where you got uh, the blessed sacrament exposed uh, around the clock, right? Well, take advantage of it. That's, it's pretty rare. Very, very few parishes have perpetual adoration. Here you have it. Uh, don't be negligent in the opportunity you have. Uh, 
I would suggest all of you get some type of spiritual direction to help you to really grow in your prayer life. But give the Lord that hour. And you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Some of you are thinking, looking at me somewhat with jaundiced eyes, uh, saying, how on earth can I spend an hour in prayer? Come on, that's a lot of baloney. You you live in New York language. That's that's hogwash. It's malarkey. (laughs) You can spend an hour watching TV or on your phone, right? Hello? Face it, we're... We're famous for wasting time on things, if they're not sinful, superficial, mediocre activities. As I said in one of my masses yesterday, I think one of the biggest problems in this country is mediocre Catholicism. Too many mediocre, lukewarm, half-baked Catholics, no? We say we follow Christ, but we only follow him half-heartedly on a good day, huh? And the reason is very clear to me. There's no fire. There's no fire. Where does fire come from? The Holy Spirit. How does that Holy Spirit come to us? It's going to come to us through prayer. All the graces we receive in our life come through prayer. Did you know that? (laughs) If not your prayer, maybe your grandmother was praying for you, your mother's praying for you, or a Carmelite nun is praying for you. All graces come through prayer. St. Alphonsus. All prayer, all graces come through prayer. And you have the, think about if you had the opportunity to meet the most famous person in the world. I think this church would be packed. What would happen if John Paul II would come back to visit us in person? Wow. Think this church would be full? How about if Mother Teresa would come to visit us? Wow. How about if John Bosco would come to give us a talk to the young people? Hey, Gabe, would they show up? (laughs) They better. He's the best, huh? How about if Mexicans, Juan Diego, wow, Juan Diego. Hmm? How about if Our Lady Guadalupe were to come to visit us? Or if you like Our Lady Fatima, Our Lady Lourdes, no? Yeah, I think you'd have you know, a court of, te- of the Texans would come to see that, huh? Even people come from California. But in the Blessed Sacrament, you have God. Do you believe that or not? Any Catholics here? Hmm? (laughs) Más o menos, huh? It's God. It's God. Probably the biggest regret we'll have in the Day of Judgment will be what? How little we really appreciated the Blessed Sacrament and how little we appreciated the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. That was my homily this morning, trying to motivate you to live the Mass. I think in Mass, even daily communicants, you're touching only the very tip of the iceberg in what you can receive. Know what I ask for in Mass often? Can't tell you? Can I? Lord, through this Mass, save a million souls. Know what I hear? Ask for more. That's not enough. I hear that. Why limit the infinite? That's paradoxical, that phrase. Why limit the infinite? The graces that we receive are directly in proportion to our faith. I will sometimes ask, Lord, through this Mass, let's empty purgatory. Why not? Empty purgatory. Lord, may this Mass convert the most hardened sinners in the world. Why not? So I think we're, 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 we're just touching the, the very tip of the iceberg in Mass.
because we don't really understand the power of mass. So like an analogy, we are going to mass with a thimble. The mass is like the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean put together. It's an infinite abyss of graces, and we just want a little thimble. You see one of those little thimbles or a little whiskey glass? That's all we're taking out of it. Because the mass is infinite. It's not limited. Jesus said to St. Faustina, ask with bold confidence. With bold confidence. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7? And you're going to say, we're not Protestants. We don't know, okay? Well, I'll tell you. Ask and you receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door will be open. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 9. Now, you know that verse, no? Ask. Knock, seek, and you will receive. Ask, knock, seek, you will receive. So you have to have a time. And hopefully you really a time and a place. Give yourself that hour. Did you ever read the life of the, 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 the prayer of Jesus? When did Jesus pray? You ever read Mark chapter 1? What does he say? The evangelist Mark says that Jesus, Mark chapter 1, have a typical day, day in the public life of Christ. Says that he got up way before dawn. What's the verse that follows? And he was absorbed in prayer. He got up way before dawn, okay? four o'clock, maybe three thirty. And he was absorbed in prayer. And he was so absorbed in prayer that the apostles had to seek him out because all the people were searching for him. He said, "Lord, they're looking for you." And he said, "Yes." I've come to preach the word of God. But he was absorbed in prayer. Look at the life of Jesus. 30 days in prayer and silence in Nazareth. And work too. Three years in his public life. And three hours on the cross saving us. 33 and 3. But the first 30 years of the life of Christ, sure, he worked in Nazareth, but he spent... Long periods of prayer, time in prayer. What did Jesus do at the beginning of his public ministry? We're in Lent now, right? What did he do? He spent 40 what? Days. Days. What was he doing? Praying Praying and fasting and fighting with the devil. (laughs) Yeah. And don't forget about that, too. He's praying, fasting, but he's battling with the devil. So there's no way we're going to go deep in our prayer life if we're not convinced that we got to give, we have to give time, and we have to give time, goodwill, effort, and we have to have some some prayer place. And here you have the opportunity of praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Okay. Uh, Next point I'd like to make is this. I made reference to this in my homily today. But none of us are born as mystics. We're born as sons of Adam and Eve. We're born as sinners. St. Teresa of Avila said, Never go to prayer without bringing a book. This is Teresa of Avila. Sometimes I see parents bringing children into church uh, with them. The kids are maybe 
maybe 9 or 10 or 11, 12. And I, I don't see the, chil- the child with any book. That's crazy. What's the kid going to do? He's not born a mystic. He's going to be, you know, elbing his brother. He's going to be looking around. No. You know, one of the great... Well, what did you receive on your first communion day? I remember two things I received on my first communion day. First was this. Uh, I think I, it probably was 1964 I made my first communion. I remember, I remember after first, we, we went out to a restaurant to eat. Have you ever gone out to a restaurant to eat? No. <laughs> you know, back, back, back 55 years ago, at least in New York, I mean, you're two young people, you don't know that, but that was a luxury. I mean, I had... You know, pancakes? I could have maybe more than one pancake. Bacon? What, sausage? Wow! <laughs> I remember that. That was, that was a big deal, going out to a restaurant, eating out. You know? Maybe I had enough time, I'll have money to eat in back then. <laughs> but I remember my mom and dad, they bought me a prayer book. My first communion prayer book. But a year ago, my mom showed me her first communion prayer book it was back, uh, I think it was uh, 1938, no? When she made her first communion, no? So, you should, ha- you should have some textbook that's going to help you to pray. Prayer book, Liturgy of the Hours, the Psalms, the Bible, the Word of God. So you're coming, and then once you're, you're reading and God gives, you, God gives you an inspiration, stop and talk to the Lord. Stop and talk to the Lord. So the prayer book is not an end in itself. The prayer is a means to an end. It's like a bridge. It's like a bridge to connect with God. Okay, right now what I'd like to do is uh, let me give you a, a summary of a number or two from Pope Benedict XVI who wrote Verbum Domini. Have any of you read that? Never even heard of it, huh? Okay. So Pope Benedict XVI, a great writer, great intellectual. He wrote many encyclicals as Pope. And I'd like to give you a summary of one, one of the numbers in Verbum Domini on prayer. You know, Verbum Domini is a development of, of De Verbum, which is one of the dogmatic constitutions of Vatican II, which is on divine revelation, and it's basically on the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Word of God. Okay, in this, in this, and this is another number of my, uh, my presentation, is for learning to pray, we should all, as starters, we should have a prayer method. St. Ignatius gives us what is called the three powers of the soul. That's the Ignatius, which would be memory, uh, understanding, and will. That's Ignatius. No, memory, the topic, understanding, you try to, try to penetrate the truth and the will, your heart goes and he opens up and talks to God. But Pope Benedict gives in uh, Verbum Domini a classical method of prayer and it's called Lectio Divina. Have you heard of that? Let's let's go through that and use this as a, use this as a um, as a method. It's not an end in itself, but it's a means to arrive at the end. What is the end? Is God right? It's like you know, you, the bridge. The purpose of the bridge is across to get to the other side of the bridge, right? You don't want to stay on the bridge, no. None of us want to be stranded on, on the George Washington Bridge, do we? No, we want to cross it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give you the, 
The steps of, Igna- of, uh, of Pope Benedict, and I added one, a baker's dozen. And they are? Are you listening? Yes. Lexio. Meditatio. Contemplatio. Oratio. Axio. And I've added one more. Transformatio. How's your Latin? Malo, malo, malo. <laughs> if any of you know Spanish, the words are almost the same in Spanish as well as in Italian, okay? If you know Latin, Latin languages, no? So you use that as a springboard, no? So we don't have, we, if we don't have methods, we don't have methods, it's difficult to learn an art, okay? If you don't have a method to learn a language, you're not going to be learning the vocabulary, the grammar, the pronunciation. You're going to, you're going to be speaking a broken English your whole life. Even something as simple, remember when I was playing baseball in high school and college, a curveball, weighed on it and punch it to the opposite field. I mean, that was uh, the basics of hitting a curveball back, at least in the 60s. Maybe they got another way today. <laughs> But method of prayer. Let's take the words lexio. What does that mean? Lexio means you got to read. Read. In other words, you got to you got to fill your mind with holy ideas. You want to have a person that's converted to to, to the faith or or a revert. Often these people, maybe it's us, or it used to be us, our mind is filled with junk. Our mind is filled with weeds. Teresa of Avila compares prayer to weeding. When I was a kid, my mom had a garden, and guess who her gardener was? Me. I hated doing that. Because... I pulled out the weeds, they always grew back. But they were less and smaller. So people that are coming into the faith, even people that are advanced, by good reading, we're filling our mind with holy and noble thoughts. Part of the prayer dynamic is the mind. Fill your mind with the word of God. Fill your mind with the truth. Fill your mind with the scenes of the gospel. Teresa of Avila says one of the best ways to pray is to contemplate the humanity of Christ. Teresa of Avila. Contemplate the humanity of Christ. Christ in his human nature. Contemplate that. That comes about by reading the Gospels. So, Lexio. Then the next would be, Lexio would be Meditatio. What's that mean? Meditate on it. Meditate. Meditate means you got to think about it. My friends, prayer and meditation is not always that easy. So you've got meditatio. One of the best examples is is the Blessed Mother. Two times in St. Luke it says that she pondered the word of God in her heart. You know, the the Greek is to ruminate. Okay, now ruminate, we don't use that too much. But actually ruminate is, are there any cows in Texas? (laughs) Okay. Okay, a cow. You, uh, you ever see like a cow is chewing the cud? You ever see that? That's what. That's actually what ruminate means. Like a cow is is chewing, is chewing, and he's masticating, and he's pulverizing. It's taking a long time. So when the Blessed Mother was pondering, that's actually the word from Greek, 
she's thinking about it and thinking again and going over it. And I think sometimes we don't pray well because we don't take the time, the time, the effort, and the fatigue and labor to meditate. So what Pope Benedict VI is saying is, is, is that one of the faculties of prayer is our intellect. We've got to use our mind. And if our mind is filled, because we're going through a conversion, filled with weeds and a lot of junk, it takes a while. <laughs> for example, someone that makes a mission and he's been addicted to pornography for 25 years, it's going to take a while. I mean, God can work miracles, right? God can work miracles. But man, he got all those trashy images lodged in his, in his memory bank. I mean, God can, God can wipe it away. But sometimes it takes a long time to dislodge those bad images and to uproot those, uproot those ugly weeds. <laughs> St. Mary of Egypt was a prostitute until she was 20. She was converted when she was 40. It took another 20 years of, of meditation and prayer and fasting and penance to repair for her sins. It's not always that way, but God wants us to work, too. No free rides, huh? No pain, no gain, the athletes say, huh? No pain, no gain, huh? Then from meditatio, you got contemplatio. You know what that word is, right? To contemplate. Now, what does that mean? Years ago, I was doing a retreat with Owen Kearns, who was the head of the National Catholic Register of the Legionaries many years ago. And he was directing me. And remember, he said this to me. The imagination we have, it's neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's neither good nor bad. We can use the imagination for good things or bad things. But we have to train the imagination and that's what contemplation is. Teresa of Avila calls it la loca de la casa. La loquita de la casa. Habla español. <laughs> the mad woman of the house. In other words, to really train, to train the, the, our contemplative faculty, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. Now this is the essence of, of Ignatius. Once you hit the contemplations, is... This is probably the best way to, to present it. Have you ever gone to a movie? The big screen. Do uh, you have the Edwards cinema here? Okay. The big screen. Hmm? In, in color. Maybe you saw The Passion of the Christ or some really good movie. Okay, when, the contemplation is kind of like going to movies. But instead of being a passive spectator, you're an active participant. Got that? So you're not just passively sitting down popping, popping cop, pop, popcorn in your mouth and drinking Coca-Cola, but you're being engaged in it. You're becoming part of the scene. It's like Jesus is walking on the water and Peter is walking on the water. You become Peter. And you see the huge wave. <gasps> Lord, save me. Land man, a little faith. <clears throat> Grab your hand. Then you apply that to your life. We all have storms in our life, right? Sometimes we're sinking up to our eyebrows. Huh? We have to cry out, Lord, save me. That's contemplation. And you know, uh, Instagram, you, we live in a world, world of images. Right? We live in a world of images. Mm-hmm. From 74 to 78, I, I was an English major. It was, it was a world basically of reading you know, back 40 years ago. You're reading Shakespeare and Milton and Byron and you know, these classical texts if you study English literature, right? Now we live in a world, we live in a world more of images. Okay? Like young people, they don't like to read. They don't like to read, the young people. They're poor readers, no, because they never like to read, okay? So, okay, well, if they like the images, maybe treat your young people, teach them how to contemplate. Use their imagination. I've actually written a spiritual exercise program for toddlers from three to five years old. Yep. 
in which you basically present to them really beautiful images, like stained glass windows, get the mommy to get the little kid there, sit down and present it to the little child. Now talk to Jesus from your heart. I've already written it. I have to launch it. Yeah. I've written spiritual exercise program from the toddlers all the way up into the adults, no? And the exercises, are, they're based on prayer, but also Ignatius insists upon contemplation. Use your imagination to imagine you're present with Jesus and Mary. Amen? Okay, and then from contemplatio, you have, you speak Spanish, oratio. What does oratio mean? Oratio actually means to pray. It means to pray. In Spanish, orar means to pray. Oración means a prayer. It means a prayer. So you've gone from the mind to the imagination. You go to the heart. Now, open up and talk to Jesus. Talk to Mary. Talk to St. Joseph. Talk to God the Father. Talk to the Holy Spirit. Now, what can you say? What can you say in prayer? The whole gamut of the emotional life, the sentiments of your heart, can be part of prayer. The whole gamut. Everything that's in the depths of your heart, you can talk to the Lord about that. Everything. Everything. Everything that's within, talk to the Lord about that. You know, one of my favorite biblical passages related to prayer is Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And that is, come to me, all of you who are weary, and find life burdensome. Come to me, all of you who are weary. We all experience weariness. We all experience the burdens of life. Come to me, all of you are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. For you'll find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. I love that verse. We read that on the feast day of the sacred heart of Jesus, right? Come to me. That's the only time that Jesus actually, he describes his heart. The only time in the whole Bible. It's meek and humble. Those are the two characteristics of the heart of Christ. Meekness. A meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. There's a definition of meekness, okay? Meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. We all have an an emotional life, right? And who helps us to control our emotions? The Holy Spirit. Another verse that I like is St. Peter. Cast your cares upon the Lord because he watches over you. I love that. No, not you? Cast your cares upon the Lord because he worries about you. He cares about you. So, oracio. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord in your own words. Can you notice me after Mass today, if you went to Mass, is maybe you had ants in your pants, no? Uh, but I'm, I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry. After Mass, I like to sit down for three to five minutes, and I like to talk to Jesus. Those are the most important moments of prayer in your day. You hear me? I repeat. You receive communion. Those, those minutes afterward are the most important moments in your day. You have God within you. Let me tell you what I believe to be one of the best prayers you can ever say. Are you listening? Jesus, I love you. Nothing better than that. That's what I say. Nothing better than that. Why complicate life? The essence of perfection is love. Love of God. What is the greatest commandment in the world? Luke chapter 11. To love God with all your heart, 
mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Nothing greater than that. Loving God totally and fully. Another thing I often say after Mass is this. I find this prayer to be the, at least the easiest for me, maybe you're different, is to thank God. I'm, I'm, just, aware, I'm just aware that God, God has given me a lot of graces. Coming from a family of nine, uh, it, it was not a... It was not a dysfunctional. I celebrated my parents' silver, uh, the Diamond Jubilee. You know what that is? It was 60. Uh, before my dad died a couple of years ago, they celebrated their, their Diamond Jubilee. And I was having, having dinner with them. And one of them said, you know, we've been married 60 years, nine kids, 39 grandchildren, a big family, right? And they said, one of them, I think it was my dad, said, we never had a big problem in our whole married life. 60 years. What do you think about that? Yeah, and one said, you know, we never, and the other one saying, yeah, no big problem, no. no. Some quarrels, some problems. The reason was because two people with a deep spiritual life. It's not going to happen if you have a good, a good spiritual life. You're going to have a lot of conflicts right away if you're not rooted in, in prayer and not rooted in Christ. So I, I, ne- I never get tired of talking about prayer. It's my favorite topic. You know why? Because my primary purpose as a priest is to praise God, but also to save souls. That's why I'm here. To praise God, but to save souls. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? That's Jesus, right? That's the phrase that Ignatius used to convert Francis Xavier. If you've ever read the life of St. Francis Xavier, he was converted by that phrase that Ignatius repeated over and over again. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he loses his soul? So if, 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 I, if I can be a catalyst or a bridge <laughs> uh, to, to get people to pray, I'm going to get you to heaven. Amen? Amen? If I can get a catalyst to get you people to pray, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to bring your children to heaven too. It'll happen. You can get your, your kids to pray, and maybe one day, Mom, I really like to pray. That's a, that's a miracle of grace. Probably going to come because they see you praying with fervor. So there we have it, oratio. And then two other points, and then we'll, we'll close because it's already gone the hour, is axio. Axio. I like the image of the Blessed Mother. The Annunciation is contemplatio. The Visitation is axio. Right? So the Annunciation... Mary is absorbed in prayer, in dialogue with God through the Archangel Gabriel, right? But then, right after Mary gives her fiat, Behold, I am the hand, may the Lord be done to me according to the word, the or fiat, right? Right after that, Mary goes, and she goes in haste to do what? To visit her cousin Elizabeth, to bring the fruits of her contemplation to Elizabeth and John the Baptist. And then I've added the last one, Pope Benedict does not mention this, but I, I've added this to the Lectio Divina Formula, and it is transformatio. Hmm? Spanish, transformatio. Transformatio means transformation. The best way for us to be transformed, to be changed, is through a deep prayer life. If you like the words of St. Paul, St. Paul says this, it is no longer I who live, no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So, in conclusion... I haven't gotten through, I've only gotten through about five of the steps, then you'll be able to read the other five steps at home. 
In conclusion, uh, I like to quote one of the Psalms, Psalm 42, related to prayer. Related to what I said at the very beginning of the prayer. As the deer, as the deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord my God. Psalm 42. As a deer yearns, longs, Spanish anela, as a deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord my God. So I can teach you how to pray, and I've given an hour on teaching on prayer, but you have to beg the Lord on your knees. Beg the Lord through the intercession of Blessed Virgin Mary that all of you will have a hunger and thirst for prayer. Because your sanctification, the sanctification of your family, the sanctification of the world depends upon men and women and children that have decided to have a deep prayer life. Let's turn to the Blessed Mother. Do any of you know the Memorare? They love the memorari, don't you? Yes. Beautiful prayer of St. Bernard, right? The mellifluous doctor. Let's pray the memorari and ask Mary to give us a real hunger and thirst for prayer. Then afterward, um, what I'll do is uh, I'll be able to go to the confessional. And those who would like to prepare for a general confession, I'll place um, at the, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here, the list so that you can sign up to make a, Gender confession from 2 up until 5.30 uh, today as well as tomorrow and Wednesday. So if you'd like to sign up, or maybe put it, yeah, I'll put, I'll put it there so you can choose whatever day you like, okay? So let's say the memorari. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known. And then you fled to your protection and implored your help or sought your sensation who left an aid, spied with the confidence Flying to you, a virgin, a virgin, my mother. To you do I come, before you kneel, sent from the sorrow. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not our prayers, that in your mercy graciously hear me. So the rest of the afternoon also will be, I'll have a Mass at 1210, and there's going to be a Mass at 530, followed by confession, and then at 7 o'clock I'll be giving the evening prayer and someone has asked me, are they the same talks? No, every talk is different, okay? So I really believe a missionary preacher always has to start off on prayer. So tonight I'm going to start to talk about how to make a general confession, okay? So I really believe I want all of you to have the opportunity to make a general confession, and I'll give you the, uh, the nuts and bolts on how to make a general confession. Uh, we're in the very heart of, of Lent, which is a time of conversion, no better way than to go through conversion than making a general confession. The general confession does not mean abstruse or abstract or generic. That's, general confession means a confession of your whole life. Okay? So I'll give you some, some uh, explanation of that. That'll be the evening talk at 7 o'clock. Okay? So God bless you and thank you very much for coming.